Welcome back to the Texas Longhorns Orange Bloods YouTube channel. I am Ari Tepkin, along with our uh, steadfast and trustworthy leader, Jeff Ketchum. What's up, Jeff? How are you, buddy? Oh, man, it's been a while since I've heard those words. I'm good, man. I'm, uh, you know, this has been a weird week. Just this Baylor week doesn't feel like the Texas fan base knows what this team is. And really, I think they're afraid to ask the question of what is this season going to become. So there's this... There's a sense of apprehension, but also a sense of get back, getting back on the field. It's weird when these conflicted kind of feelings meet head on in a game that they typically Baylor week doesn't get the juices flowing. But I think Texas fans understand the gravity of this week that Texas really needs to win for a million different reasons. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And like you have two really disappointing games back to back and then the bye week. And so like just the taste in the mouths of Texas fans right now is not good. It's not favorable. And so it's like Baylor is an interesting team because they're good six to one, but I mean, they didn't play anybody in the non-conference. And then, I mean, they didn't even have to leave the state of Texas and they, you know, and, and then they get into conference play and it's like they beat Iowa state, which is impressive, but it wasn't in October. So, you know, it's not as impressive. If you beat them in October, it's much more impressive. And then they lose to Oklahoma State. So it's like a team that we think is good, but maybe. And the record certainly indicates that they are. So you're right. It is kind of an interesting week considering when we look, it's like, you know, it's like when you watch a show and they're like, they're like, when we, when we last heard from Texas football, they were blowing big leads late. Yeah. <laughs> so what do they have in store for us now? Uh, by the way, make sure to hit that uh, like button if you like what you're watching. <laughs> if you like what you're watching, yes, if you like to watch Texas disappoint. If Jeff and Ari are giving or making you feel like you need to get a prescription from Prozac, hit the <laughs> subscribe button, and more importantly, Ari, ring the bell so that you can get notifications every time we've got a zo uh, uh, a uh, Prozac induced kind of video to talk about. <laughs> Let's focus today, though, catch on the defense because Steve Sarkeesian, offensive minded head coach. There's been some explosions and explosive plays on offense, the quarterback situation. Be so, so much of the focus this season, and rightfully so, has been an offense. And yet, the Oklahoma game clearly, the defense was a train wreck, and it's the reason they lost the game. Oklahoma State, it was a little, a little bit of both. Both played a factor down the stretch, losing that game. But it hasn't been pretty defensively and what we're seeing here. And I think this is what you could speak to so well is these are holdover problems. These aren't exactly Pete Kwiatkowski problems. They, they fall in his lap because he's the defensive coordinator, but there are problems here tackling that, that predate <laughs> this Texas administration. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's Texas has consistently been in the back half of big 12 defenses for the last few years, I mean, I mean, you know, Charlie and Vance, Be Charlie and Vance Bedford showed up and had one really good year in that first year. And then it just went to hell in a handbasket the next two years. Herman's defenses, you know, I think Todd Orlando had a good year and then he chased his tail right. until he was pushed out of town. Chris Ash comes in. It doesn't happen right away for him either. And he only gets a year. And now you got Pete Kwiatkowski coming in and he comes in with a sterling reputation. He's thought of as a made guy in college football on the defensive side of the ball. And yet when you've watched this Texas defense, it just hasn't come together. And look, they lack, and we've, ta we've talked about this in videos in the summer a lot. The, the pieces of personnel that this team was missing how important would it be to not be able to have a consistent pass rushing threat? What does it mean to have good players, but no real playmaking? And, and, you know, last year, Joseph Osai wins the Oklahoma State game because he was just so damn good that he put the team on his back and he, you know, however many sacks was needed that day, he was going to get it. They don't have that on this team. I think this defense has five or six NFL pieces playing for it, which is what's going to make this thing really weird when next right. year these dudes are earning NFL paychecks 
And for people who are like, what? DeMarvion Overshone, I think, is an absolute NFL football player. No question. I think Deshaun Jameson is going to play on an NFL team. I think Anthony Cook, the way that he's played this season, that guy's making an NFL roster, assuming he's just not terrible on special teams. I think that, uh, you know, I think Darian Dunn's going to get a camp invite. I think Josh Thompson is going to make an NFL team. That's five. Snacks? Snacks is six. Again, we're not saying they're going to start on NFL teams. We're not saying they're going to the Pro Bowl. There are 53 guys on a roster. They're like, 75 practice squad spots on teams these days like if you're pretty good and you've played a lot of football you'd be surprised at what makes the nfl you know they're great dbs are hard to find for instance and so it's like i think these dbs have actually and bj foster is a guy that i think based on his play this season he's gonna go to an nfl camp and training camp and and have a chance They've got pieces, but they lack a pass rusher and they lack real playmakers. And the lack of a playmakers are part of what's made the secondary, I think, vulnerable. They got nobody getting to the quarterback. So, like, it's it's like they're playing with eight and a half good players. And I think they're missing a couple of things. And I think it's going to hurt the defense all season long. And it's just weird because I think that everybody wants to say, this defense sucks. And it's like, well, no. It's a little more nuanced than that. And that's part of what makes this whole thing, I think, frustrating for everybody involved is that the players involved on this defense aren't terrible, but they're not playing well as a unit at all. Yeah, and the numbers aren't good. The numbers don't indicate that this is a good defense in any capacity. Um, You know, like, for instance, Oklahoma's defense is okay against the run. It has not been of late, but, like, overall, over the season, it's okay against the run. Oklahoma's terrible against the pass. With Texas – I mean, and I always like to look at um, opponent rush yards per play or pass yards per attempt. I think that's a good indicator. Texas is 112th in opponent rush yards per play. They gave up 5.2 rush yards per every rush attempt um, and 70th in opponent pass yards per attempt, which isn't bad. Middle of the pack, I guess, college football, 7.4. But they are, they're 97th in yards per game. They're giving up 434.9 yards per game. And the last three games, catch, they're at 470 yards per game, which isn't hard to believe considering what the last two games have looked like. Um, the big one also is 101st out of 130 teams in opponent yards per play, which is 6.1. Texas is giving up six yards per play. Just tough to win defensively when you're doing that. So what is the issue in your mind? Because I think you're right. There's some players, there's some Sunday players and talent on this defense. Is it schematic? Is it just that they aren't running the right defense? Are they not attacking? What, obviously the tackling is an issue. That's clearly an issue. It's not the only issue though. I think there are two positions where they're just really hurting right now. I think the edge rush position where Ray Thornton has been the primary starter all season long. He's just not a factor as a pass rusher. And when you look at where I think I saw a stat on the Longhorn Network a week ago going into the press conference that Texas was last in the country in passing efficiency against plays 20 yards or more. Which makes sense. They're horrible at giving up the big play down the field. And I think that we've seen quarterbacks have a lot of time against this Texas secondary where – you know, I don't know. I have to go, I'm not looking at the stats right now. I know going into the Oklahoma State game, I don't think there was anybody on the team that had more than two sacks. And I don't think there was anybody like they they they're just not getting pressure from any place on the field. And I think they've got a hole at linebacker. So I think that, you know, if you're gonna call out Ray Thornton and say solid player, but in terms of being a plus pass rush guy that's gonna disrupt games and there's nobody else so it's not like it's it's ray thornton's fault he's just the guy right that's in that position where you he's in that joseph osai position and but he's not joseph osai joseph osai right and nobody on the roster is i mean you say what you want to about ray but if he doesn't come in as a grad transfer then presumably they're playing somebody in that position who's not better than him because he's been starting all season so and then i think you look at the linebacker duo of Overshone and Luke Brockermeyer, 
And I think Luke Brockermeyer against a lot of college football teams, you're perfectly fine having him on the field. I think the last few games have exposed Luke in the, not that he's not a good player, but that I think he has some limited capacities as a player and that teams have found running to his side of the, you know, you go back to that last play, the Oklahoma game winning touchdown play. That was them. They, they, they basically told Texas they weren't even trying to score a touchdown, right. but they were like, we know where the getting's good. And this is the play. And oh, Oklahoma state kind of did the exact same thing. Like teams have learned run it to the outside, run to your left on the outside. And Texas's pursuit from that second level of the defense isn't getting there all the time. And that's even when Overshone's on the field. And we know that like range isn't an issue for him. But I think that's a Ray Thornton side of the field. That's a Luke Brockermeyer side of the field. And I think those two areas really handicap that, that Texas – on Warren, I were going to do a show earlier this week where if you could pick any one player in the country to come in and be a player for the Longhorns, who would you go get? And I think a lot of people instinctively would think offensive line. And for me, I was like, get the best, all, the best linebacker in America and put that guy next to Overshone. And suddenly your defense is, I think, really good. But I think the fact that they don't have in a in a linebacker scheme, I mean, Kwiatkowski's defense is supposed to be super linebacker friendly, and it's supposed to be a defense that allows the linebackers to kind of roam free and, and, and make the plays. We've seen Overshone thrive in that kind of a role. Brockermeyer's just not a guy that I think is a Sunday player. And that is a position on that defense that needs that kind of level of athleticism and, 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 and playmaking. And I think those two things have really hurt this defense on both defending the run and defending the pass. It's a fun exercise. So the guy you're describing to me would be Henry To'o To'o, the Tennessee transfer to Alabama. But I, I'll just, I'll take Kayvon Thibodeau to rush the yes. edge for this team. <laughs> I was hurt. actually thinking of Micah Parsons from last year. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a guy that you just right. line up on the field and just say go. Right. And he can run the pa- rush the passer, but if you just put him on the field and say go, you know, at Penn State, he was everywhere. Right. Modern and, linebacker. Plays and and Texas levels. needs an everywhere linebacker. But yeah, go get the guy that transferred to Tennessee that's starting, you know, for Alabama. And that's the kind of guy they need there. You got even a poor man's version of something <laughs> like that would be okay. And they just don't have that. I think you're right too about pass rush. You know, it's it's really difficult to cover if you don't have a guy that can consistently like command double teams and get after the passer. I mean, I and, and I don't blame Sark for this because you know you're you're coming in late to the ball game. It would have been nice for him to be able to play the transfer port a little bit and find a good pass rusher because you're losing Osai, and you know he just didn't have the time for it. I, you know, I. I'd imagine if they come into the season next year and they're still as thin pass rusher as they are, that's an indictment on, on Sark. And I, I, it is like, we've reached the era of free agency. There was a great piece this week written by Adam Rittenberg from ESPN. Uh, who's a colleague of mine at Sirius XM as well. And he, he basically talked to Mel Tucker at Michigan state. They're seven and oh here for a game against Michigan. Now they haven't played a bunch of t- great teams. So they're how legit are they as a seven and oh team, but the way that he's used his knowledge of the pro game where I think there's a similarity of, you know, you draft and develop guys and then you fit your holes in free agency. That's kind of the same thing in college now too. And that's exactly what Mel Tucker has done at Michigan state so well. And it's the reason Clemson is not good this year because Dabo doesn't, he won't take transfers. And I think that's a, that's a huge shortfall for him, but you have to be able you the ba- the core of your team has to be built through recruiting. You have to recruit and develop and bring guys up through your culture and all that stuff and guys that fit your locker room and then when you when you miss in recruiting or guys leave or whatever, you know, whatever attrition you have, you've got to fill those holes um, through the transfer portal. And so I, I would expect Sark to be a lot more active in the portal this year because it's college football's free agency now with, you know, the one year free pass, the one time free pass that guys get. Yeah, I think that Texas fans 
you know, a year ago, I really tried to stress. Matter of fact, Jason Sukumel and I would argue about this all the time because Sukumel is not a big fan of the portal. He doesn't believe in the talent that's in the portal. And I have been trying to convince everybody that will listen that now that everybody can get in the portal and not have to sit out a year, guys who are good are right. going to go into the portal because the Alabama, you can argue that Alabama's two best players right now are right. on both sides of the ball came through the portal. They're, they've got a, a, a likely All-American wide receiver that transfers from Ohio State who's having a monster year. Yep. And then you look at the linebacker, they take, you know, what's the kid's name from Tennessee? To'o To'o, Henry To'o To'o. Yes, thank you. Name. Um, you know, that guy was thought of as the SEC's best linebacker or among them a year ago. Like, yep. he was Tennessee's best player. Now, Tennessee had its issues or whatever, but I think we're going to see more issues like this. Uh, we're really good players, you know, are looking to upgrade. I, and I think it's only going to improve – I think a year ago, Texas fans were like, eh, whatever. And then they saw Sark using the portal, but not really knowing what to think about it. And I think they're going to realize, I think they're realizing now, because I just started a thread today on Orange Bloods, like it's portal season. Right? It doesn't matter that it's October. It totally. is officially portal season. And if you're not running your program in a way where you're not on a five-star offensive lineman from Oregon from the 2020 class just went into the portal. If you're not on that kid because you're busy in the middle of the season, you are falling behind. This is the new wave of college football. And it, I wrote an article about it this weekend. You're, if you're Sark, you almost need some of your dead weight in the program to get the hell on out. Right. Right. You need to create because they're going to create NCAA is going to create legislation that's going to uh, give you flexibility because the portal now is the 85 25 man doesn't work. Right. So they're going to, in this off season, change the rules so that if you get decimated by the portal, suddenly you're not playing at 55 scholarships and not able to improve, get your program back up because of the 25 man per year scholarship rule. So Texas is going to be in a position next year where I think Sark's got to get, after watching the program for a year, dead weight's got to be pushed out the door in whatever nice way you can do that, where it doesn't look like you trap door a guy, right? You right. need to let him know this probably isn't the place where you're going to play a lot of football. So if you want to play, I'm not telling you to go, but like it might not, you might, you might think about it. The more guys that leave, the more roster spots open up and that the legislation is created that everybody in the sport seems to believe is going to be created. Yep. Then you're right. It really turns into free agency. And if you are really ahead of the curve, you aren't waiting for kids to get into the portal. You're using your network of contacts to let kids know, Hey, if you enter the portal, we got a spot for you. Yep. And some schools already do that really, really well. Yep. And Tampering some schools goes on. Are, you look, Texas fans are like, why does Utah keep getting commitments from our players 24 hours after they go into the portal? And it's like, because they are working it. They are living in the gray area. Yep. And I would invite Sarkeesian and his staff. If look, I, I'm Mr. Do It Right. But the gray area is doing it right as far as I'm concerned. Because that is where the sport is won and lost. And you're just not giving yourself a chance if you're not thinking outside. What have they not created a rule against? Not what they've created. What have they not said I can't do? What the gray areas. And yep. until they make a rule specific that says I can't do that, I'll just keep doing it. And you can say, well, is is it is that gray area? You say, well, is there a rule against it? <laughs> and, and no, I mean, look, no. And Sukumel's not entirely wrong, but I think it's it. There's just more nuance to it, and like yeah. sometimes, like in a Henry To'o To'o or the Alabama transfers, like that's a situation where that's really good talent that's leaving and that's available. Then there are guys that aren't the right fits at certain places. Kenneth Walker, who's leading rusher in the country right now, wasn't a good fit. He found a good scheme fit. Jay, you know, Jalen Warren 
another guy. And this is a gr- perfect segue for us here, Catch, because Texas did a fantastic job against Jalen Warren for three plus quarters. I, when I went back and watched that game, it was another one of those like, how did they lose this game? They had him completely bottled up. He was at four yards per carry through his first, I think, 21 carries. The final 12 were the one that broke the camel's back. He was over eight yards a carry. Yeah. And so I don't know what changed, but they if they don't force Baylor this week to have to make plays with Gary Bohanna at the quarterback, they're going to lose because that's the this is their bread and butter. Baylor's going to look at Texas 112th in the nation in opponent rush yards per attempt at 5.2 and say, that's what we're going to do until they stop us. Abram Smith and Tristan Ebner are really good running backs. And those are guys that are both capable and have already this year gone for hundred yards in the game. They're good. If you don't for like, if you stop the run, now you force Gary Bohannon to have to make plays and Baylor hasn't trusted him to do that this year. I think Baylor's a bad, you know, styles make fights in boxing. And it's remember watching the original Rocky and like, uh, you know, Apollo's, you know, what are our boys looking at film? Who's his manager's name? Uh, I'm just drawing a blank. Anyway, his manager's watching film. He's like, yo, man, you need to watch this guy. He's, he's dangerous. And Apollo Creed's like, I'm dangerous. And like, as it turns out, Rocky was his kryptonite. Like Apollo Creed, as great as he was, that Rocky style made for a bad matchup with him. Um, I think Baylor does that with Texas Mick. a little bit. What's that? Mick. Not Mick, Apollo's trainer. Oh, Apollo's trainer. Okay, yeah, yeah. The guy like, that goes with Rock, Duke. Duke is his Duke. name. Duke and Mick. Yes. Duke goes with him to Russia. Yes. That Duke. Yeah. So the chess plane guy in Rocky IV. Uh, I think Baylor matches up. I think it's just a bad matchup for Texas because yep. Baylor's going to commit themselves to running the football because they do it really well. Texas averages 230 yards a game rushing the football. Baylor averages 239. Yeah. And they played Oklahoma State. You know what I mean? Like they played Iowa State. They they played BYU. They played credible defenses. Yep. To the point where you get seven games in and say, how's their running game? It's like, oh, 239 per game. It wasn't all built up against the little sisters of the poor that they would have played in the non conference. Right. I think Mike Gundy's game plan against Texas was keep the game close and the second half will take them into the deep waters and drown them. And I think, I think Baylor is, is fit to do the same thing where survive the Sarkeesian offensive onslaught in the first half, which we've seen kind of against Oklahoma state. We saw it against Oklahoma. Lord knows we saw it against Texas tech. If you can make it a one possession game after halftime, You've got Texas right where you want them because, as you alluded to, for whatever reason, the defense late in games, it's like they're a 45-minute defense. Yep. And minutes 46 through 60, the wheels have come off. And until Texas can show that that's not the blueprint by by showing up this weekend and when Baylor tries to choke you out in the, in the ocean in the fourth quarter – you know, prove that you can safely swim back to the shore and go, I'm, I'm good. That didn't bother me. So it's a big, and the problem is Iowa State's a lot like Baylor. I mean, you know, they'll ride Brees Hall and they'll be wanting to run the ball in the fourth quarter. So Texas is Achilles Hill in each of the next two games will be greatly tested. The good news is, Ari, if you're Texas and you can survive those tests that both of those teams are going to try to administer against you. Nobody else on the schedule is going to be able to quite do what those two teams can do with regards to Texas's weakness. So either they come out of it this, these next two weeks and they save their season. And, and from there, they can, I think, really potentially take off and finish the year strongly. Or, boy, in a couple of weeks, we're really talking about the thing that sucked this season down into the drain was this thing on defense that they just never could quite get a, get a grip on. Yep. And, and I'll say this, the difference for Baylor between the Iowa state game and the Oklahoma state game was Iowa state. They didn't have to throw the football. 
Iowa State couldn't stop their running attack. And then the turnovers, too, for Iowa State were brutal. A lot of short fields. But the Oklahoma State game is this great blueprint that they didn't want Gary Bohannon to throw the football. And I, like me personally, I don't think he's that bad of a quarterback. They just, it's, you. it's a defensive minded head coach that they want to play defense and run the football. But if they attempted just a few more passes against Oklahoma State, they might have beaten them, but they just didn't. They just refused to do it. And because of that, they lost the game. And uh, real quick, I'll let you in on a secret. I like Baylor's wide receivers. Yeah. <laughs> RJ Sneed, uh, RJ Sneed and, 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 um, there's, they, they, they Ty can Juan attack. Thornton. Like we talk about Bohan and I think that you're running the football. And if you're Baylor, you're just throwing it down the field because if that's Texas's weakness, you know, Bohan is, I think less dangerous for Baylor. If he's not going short and intermediate, I think when he's just throwing the ball down the field, you know, he's just reading where's his one-on-one -on -one coverage. And he's given his guy a chance to make plays. I think that's where Texas is vulnerable. And so, you know, I think, again, but he's not going to throw the ball 30 times. But with his receivers, if they don't show up to play and they do the things that they've done in recent weeks, you know, Bohannon can throw the ball 15 times, but he might throw for more than 220 yards. Right, right, and exactly. we won't look at it and go, God, he was great from a completion attempt standpoint. But, boy, you, it might be that the three of those are touchdowns. So, Texas really has to find a way to make him nervous and uncomfortable because when he's not, he's actually pretty good, and he's probably pretty good because his receivers can be scary. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, make sure if you have not yet already, and by the way, if you watch this video this long, most, most – Likely you liked what you saw. So give it a thumbs up. Also make sure to subscribe. We were some smart sons of guns in this video. <laughs> make sure to subscribe and ring the bell. That way you're always notified we post new videos. But for Jeff Ketchum, I'm Ari Temkin. We're out. Peace.